I'm Mike, and this is Raytown Chop Shop. I'm Austin, and we're really making progress on the Calabunga. In part seven, we'll tackle the wires and the cables. Once again, the lathe I bought a few months ago has really come in handy. Here, I'm turning a plug that will go in the end of a tube that will connect the two clutch cables we had to use in order to reach from the handlebars back to the engine. Here's the final result. This plug will attach to the end of the clutch cable coming off the handlebars. The cable end has a button type stop on it, so Austin cut the plug so that the button seats down in it. The plug goes into the tube on one end. We'll weld the plug to the tube for the final connection. The other clutch cable, the one going to the engine, has a barrel type stop on it, so I had to file a half round groove in the plug. Looks like the barrel stop is going to sit perfectly down in the plug. Austin used his Dremel to cut a slot in the plug so we could insert the cable. With the groove filed and the slot cut, the plug fits perfectly on the end of the clutch cable. We thought we had a problem with the clutch operating correctly, so Austin removed the clutch cover and clutch rod. Turns out everything was okay. Well, now we have to replace the clutch cover gasket that got messed up when the cover came off. Time to make the brackets that are going to hold the clutch cable. I notched a piece of flat bar for the front bracket. I notched a piece of angle iron for the back clutch cable bracket. You'll see why we used angle iron instead of flat bar a little later on. Austin got the angle iron bracket ready for tack welding. Once it was in place, a couple quick tacks should hold it long enough to make sure the clutch cable system is going to work. Austin fabricated a sheet metal clamp to hold the rear clutch cable in place on the bracket. This is why we used angle iron for this bracket. We need a surface to drill a hole for the bolt that's going to squeeze the clamp. Austin got the front bracket positioned and tacked it in place. Once we had both clutch cables installed in the brackets, we measured the gap between the two ends so we could cut the connecting tube to length. After drilling a hole and cutting a slot in the 7.5 inch connecting tube, Austin tacked the front plug into the tube. Dad pulled the clutch lever while I held the connecting tube in place. Here you can see how the cable fits into the tube and plug. So far, it looks like our plan is going to work. Here's the plug that's going to go on the other end of the connecting tube. Austin lined up the two slots and tacked it in place. Time to put it all together. I installed the end of the clutch cable from the engine first. The cable from the handlebars came off Maggie's 79 Honda we're restoring. We're putting a new cable on her bike. Once we had the two cables connected, Austin operated the clutch lever. Our connecting tube worked just the way we had hoped. And the clutch pin is engaging and disengaging the clutch plates. 
Once we were sure the clutch cable was going to work, Austin final welded the brackets to the go-kart frame. That's one major step out of the way. I knew from riding the Kawasaki before we tore it apart that it needed a lot of choke before the engine warmed up enough to idle right. So I started figuring out a way to operate the choke without having to run a long cable all the way back up to the handlebars like it was originally. It took a while, but I finally managed to remove the original choke cable. I decided we didn't need anything fancy for the choke lever, so I just used a couple pieces of flat bar for the choke bracket and lever. My dad says it looks like something that came off of Fred Flintstone's car. I tacked the choke bracket to the go-kart frame to give it a try. Looks like it's going to work great. I can operate the choke from the seat by reaching back. Time to move all the electrical controls from the engine to the handlebars. Austin plans to use the Kawabunga as sort of a motorcycle training vehicle for beginners. So he wants it to operate pretty much the same way as a regular motorcycle, but the driver doesn't have to worry about keeping the vehicle upright and balanced. There are three basic electrical controls that need to be moved. The ignition switch, the starter, and the turn signal lights. We moved all three about four feet forward from where they originally were, which means we have to lengthen all the wires. All the control switches and cables are now installed on the handlebars. Now all we have to do is connect them to the engine. Austin ordered a bunch of electrical components we're going to need, including 6-pin, 8-pin, and 12-pin connectors, 220 heat shrink butt connectors, and 10 spools of 16-gauge wire. Each spool has 100 feet of wire on it. To make life easier, we slid the spools of wire onto a steel rod. Once all the spools were on the rod, we hung it from the roof rafter so we could unwind the wire and cut it to length a whole lot easier. Big moment here. Austin cut the ignition switch wires at the handlebars. No going back. I plugged in the ignition switch connector at the engine. It's right underneath where the gas tank is mounted. Notice his sunburned hands. We rode our motorcycles the day before for a few hours. Now, maybe next time he'll wear his gloves. I knew we were going to be removing the engine down the road, so I wanted all the electrical connectors to be easy to get to so we wouldn't have to take the gas tank off every time. So we're going to use these connectors and put them somewhere they're easily disconnected. Time to extend the first wires. We measured where we wanted the connector to end up, and Austin stripped the wires, and I used the heat gun on the butt connectors to join the original wires and the extension wires. I stripped the other end of the extension wires, crimped on the connector pins, and installed the connector plug. Dad measured how long the new wires had to be to reach from the handlebars back to the engine. We cut off seven and a half feet of new wires and Austin stripped the ends. He installed the female pins on the wires. And inserted them into the eight pin connector. Using a multimeter, we checked our connections before we butt connected the entire harness to the ignition switch. After I stripped the ends of the long wires, I slid the original ignition switch wires and the new long wires into the butt connectors. Dad used the heat gun to melt the solder that would join the two wires and shrink the plastic around them. Time to test our wiring. Austin turned the key and I checked the original instrument panel. The neutral, oil pressure, and temperature lights came on. Success! So far. Next came the starter switch wiring that also includes the brake light switch. Four of the wires had duplicate colors, so we used some masking tape to label which wire went where. Again, I stripped the ends, crimped on the new connector pins,
installed the 6-pin connector. And then Dad and I checked the continuity with a multimeter. When they all tested OK, we butt connected the entire harness. Dad zip tied the harness to the frame rails. We've been pretty lucky so far with the new wire colors matching up pretty good with the Kawasaki wiring. But the turn signal switch had 10 wires and half the colors didn't match up with our new wires. So we wrote down the original wire colors and the corresponding new wire colors we were going to use. Here's a demonstration of why we put the wire spools on a steel rod and hung them from the rafter. We needed 10 wires 7 feet long. All I had to do was hold all 10 ends together and pull. Dad held the tape measure and we pulled down 7 feet of wire all at once. Austin cut all 10 wires at once. We are now on the final leg of our wiring journey. For the last time, I stripped the wires, crimped the pins, installed the new connector, checked continuity with a multimeter, Strip the other ends of the wires, and use the heat gun on the butt connectors. I connected the turn signal control switch to the original connection on the bike. About the only thing we could check on this harness was the clutch safety switch and horn, since we're not installing turn signals right now. And a funny thing happened when we <coughs> tested the horn. The needle on the tachometer moved. I knew the tack wasn't working when I brought the bike home, so we're going to have to figure out why the horn makes the tack needle jump. Wow, that's a lot of wires. About 170 feet worth. Down the road, we're going to encase all the wiring in a loom and make it look nice and pretty. Until then, we'll just leave them zip tied to the frame. Also notice that the new connectors are easy to get to whenever we have to remove the engine. That wraps up part seven of the Cowabunga build. We're getting really close, and hopefully in part eight, we'll go for our first test drive. Thanks for watching.